who, who that grotesque old man sitting there? Who is there? He moves here every time I move. Oh, it's me. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, he's my friend, my best friend, my only friend. Hey, come here. Come here. Say hi to everybody. Yeah. Hey, say it's me. It's me. <laughs> Listen, baby. Listen. You stick with me. You stick with me. I'll be your friend, your best friend, your only friend. It's me. You stick with me, everything will be okay. And we've been. This has been a pretty rough week. This uh, this week. Oh, who am I? <clears throat> uh, this is uh, Jack. No, John. What day of the week is it? Oh, I know. It's it's uh, Harry. Yeah, Harry. My last name is that is uh, the family name for um, that French poet, Balzac. Yeah, I'm your friend, your best friend, your only friend, Harry Balzac, bringing you the news of the day. This has been a real tough week. Tough week. Toughest week of my life. Now these these uh, appointments. I mean, I, now there's some things I want to talk about. But first, I got to talk about what's been going on this week. I mean, I, it's almost killed me. I feel like I'm standing on the edge, watching the news. I can't watch the news. It's too gut wrenching. It's just too gut wrenching. It's horrible. I I just feel horrible for these people. Yeah, you you do too, don't you? You feel horrible about it too, don't you? Yeah, that's Hudson. Hudson's my dog. Have you been watching those, the hearings, the Kavanaugh, Ford hearings? Or he'd say Ford versus Kavanaugh. I don't know. But don't you worry. We'll get Judge Kavanaugh on the bench and everything will be okay. Everything will turn out all right. Right? Right? Oh, God. Yeah, I've, ma I've made a study of truth and deception. Early in my life, I took some classes in lie detection. And I bought a lie detector, $4,000 voice stress analyzer. And I became a voice stress analyst and uh, doing pretty well until I got, got a uh, gig working with the, uh, the local cops. Polygrapher. We want to do a test and see if we can compare the voice stress analysis with polygraphy. You know, the little, body, the usual lie detector. I had a voice stress analyzer, which determines whether you're telling a lie or not through the stress in your voice. And if you get a 20% deviance on the average stress level of a person's voice, that's usually indicative of a lie. Lie, you liar. You're a liar. So I um, did that for a while until I got to working with the, uh, the one of the cops is polygrapher on comparing these two, the polygraph versus the voice stress analyzer to see if there was any correlation. And they found out about it and they fired him. I already felt bad about it. So anyway, I, and, and I already didn't like it because it's just, it's too, uh, too hair raising, you know. It's, uh, it's, I don't like calling people a liar. I don't like doing that. And you're not really sure whether it's the, really what is the truth based on these mechanical measures. 
So anyway, but I can't help but still kind of look at people in, in, through that lens. I'm watching Kavanaugh give his, uh, Judge Kavanaugh, give his testimony and the uh, testimony of um, Christine Ford. And uh, Kavanaugh is reaching down and grabbing the bottle a lot and drinking from his bottle, taking sips. At one point, he loses his temper starts berating the, the senators who are questioning him, <laughs> asking them if they've ever had a beer. <laughs> I, they said, I really like beer. I really like beer. I'm thinking, what am I watching here? And at one point, he breaks down. He starts to break down. And you can tell he doesn't know what to say. He's like, lost his place on the page or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's like the guy is sweating bullets. His eyes are bugging out. You could wipe him off with a stick. God, I've never seen anything like that before. This guy wants to be a Supreme Court judge. And he's doing what she, she, her testimony was right on her. I mean, it was, I was right there in the room with her when she's talking about it. I wasn't when I was, you know, when I wasn't with him. <laughs> Anyway, I think he was lying. And what else can he do? He's going to admit to that? He's got to lie. It's, you know, you, you just have to, like, just take that off the table. Of course he's lying. You know, and unless you want to say, well, if, if this is all made up or something. What, she made up this fantastic story about him doing this to her? I mean, you don't believe that, do you? that they made this up. You don't believe that, do you? Well, the belief is really seems to be influenced by a lot of the things that, that we, um, that we want to believe, you know, you believe what you want to believe. Oh yeah. And I've been running into that, of course, for 20 years now in homeopathy, because people don't want to believe homeopathy. A lot of people, not everybody. A lot of people really don't want to believe it. And the ones that do believe it really don't want to hear about the science of it either. I've made kind of a study of the science of it. And uh, they don't want to hear it. From what I've seen, most people don't have an interest in really what's, what's going on here. And I've been getting a few comments on an earlier video I made about the TED challenge. <clears throat> you know, the... Um, TED Talks, Randy, James Randy did a TED Talk on homeopathy, and I want to rebut it. And I did a video a couple weeks ago about how I'd like to accept his challenge again and again, you know, on stage at the TED Talks and explain homeopathy, how, how it works, why we know it works, the physical and physical chemical measures of it, the biochemical tests that prove that these are real material substances. So anyway, I made a video that's saying that I want, to, I want my time on TED. I should just do a TED Talk and just call it a TED Talk. Just do it here, just call it TED Talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is Harry, Harry Balzac, talking to you about TED for homeopathy. <laughs> oh God, what a world, what a world we live in. There's this organization that's um, German skeptical organization that's offering now 50,000 euros. If somebody can come up with a test that will distinguish one homeopathic remedy from another. I mean, 50,000 50, euros for that. If you can come up with this test. It's already been done. It's like, hey, hello. Hello. Yeah, it's already been done. You skeptical, hey, you German idiots. Yeah, it's published. Go read, go read the, the, it's online. <laughs> it's right in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. It's right in front of you. That's what I tell him when I have a piece of chicken for, for, for him. He can't see very good because he's got all this fur all over his face. He can't see too good, so I have to hold the chicken. Come here. 
Show me where people can see it. Oh, you're on this side now. You're making this difficult, you know. You're supposed to be the floor director. You're not supposed to come in here and screw things up. Yeah, a little piece of chicken. I had to hold it under his nose. Anyway, DeSkeptiker is offering 50,000 euros for proof of homeopathy by distinguishing one homeopathic substance from another. And it's already been done and published. You can see the results called RAO. R, type in R A O, epitaxy, E P I T A X Y. And it'll pop right up. It'll be the first one on, on the Google readout, on the printout. R A L, RAO is the uh, name of the one of the authors. The other one is also done by Roy, Russell Roy participated in that, who's a well-known academic where they came up with a test that would separate these, where they could determine through spectroscopic means the identity of one remedy from another, not just whether or not it was a homeopathic remedy or not, which was my protocol to Randy. But they actually were able to distinguish one, one, pro, one from another, which is what the, the skeptical organization wants, wants them to do, wants somebody to do for 50 grand. But of course, before, in their test, you know, contrary to Randy, you have to pay it to have them accept your application. It's like, what a scam. These skeptics are so dishonest, and it's so patent. I mean, anybody can see it. So anyway, um, one of the comments left on this was I wasn't being specific enough. Exactly what what is it that you, what is it you're talking about, John? Harry, Jack, whatever your name is, what, 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 what is it you're talking about? Well, I'm, as far as I know, I'm the only guy on the planet right now who is talking about this. So I'm not claiming to be especially creative or dis discovery really anything much of anything. I mean, I'm using classical scientific terms to explain what the homeopathic remedy is and its physical chemical distinctions. What What's the physical chemi chemistry of the homeopathic remedy? And it starts out with molecular dissociation, dissociating the uh, particle into ions, ionizing it, or deionizing the molecule and ionizing the solvent. So it's not, and, it's, and it can be demonstrated through a number of physical tests. So, it's the expanding electron that expands from one generation to another. Oh, and this is kind of interesting. I don't know if I talked about this before. But the in the Chikramane transmission electron microscopy test, they detected what looked like the actual solute in the post avogadro solutions. So what should have been left out from, um, from dilution, from diluting it out, was detected in transmission electron microscopy by a group of scientists under the name of Chikermain, the Chikermain study. And so basic, I mean, but they didn't know that it ionizes all these, this, the solid ionizes, it goes into electron, becomes electrons by, by the, uh, by that, by the sixth dilution, the sixth the decimal dilution. So there's, there is no particulate left in the remedy after the, after the sixth decimal dilution, it's all been ionized. It's electrons. It's not molecular anymore. It, yeah, you following me? So in these step dilutions where they keep diluting it way past the Avogadro limit, the molecular dilution limit, these guys were seeing particulate in the remedy. Gold. They were actually testing for homeopathic gold, and they found it. And they, they, say, and they actually have a picture of it, this lump of something. You know, it's real tiny. What they were looking at, they, they think that it was, it's delivered from one remedy to the other by the eyedropper. Because it all raises it to, to the froth where it comes up. I mean, it's just some ridiculous theory that, that they, froth theory. Look it up, Shikramane. Well, I won't, I'm not going to spell up. Maybe I can put a link in the description area. But anyway, what it is, is that the silica from the sides of the succussion container 
are sloughing off or leaching off due to the product nature of the, of the aqueous solvent, right? <laughs> Just lost half my audience. And it's uh, the electrons from the hydrolytic dissociation are electroplating the, the, the leached silica from the bottle. And so it's actually increasing as it goes through these su succession of step dilutions. The silica content, silica content from the glass, the little nanoparticles of glass that are sloughing off from the inside during the succussion process are actually increasing in number as, it, as they go through these step dilutions. <laughs> these guys are looking at it and they go, well, this looks like some kind of alchemy or spontaneous progression, <laughs> materialization, spontaneous materialization. The solar is growing. Well, what's happening is that it's the uh, silica is, is coming off the side of the container and is being electroplated by the hydrolytic action of uh, the H2O molecule. How about that, baby? I just explained homeopathy to you. That would be one million bucks, please. Thank you. Well, tune in again as soon as you can. This is Harry Balzac signing off saying thank you very much for your time and temperature.